All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Keith Adams. I'm the Marketing Communications Manager for Gates Air, and I'd like to welcome you to our Mission Possible Spectrum Repack webinar series. Uh, the first of the series of three today is Repack in Review with Martin Horsepool, who is the Product Manager of our TV Transmission Division. We'll be starting the webinar um, here shortly. We're going to give people a little bit more time to hop on, but in the meantime, uh, please hang tight, and we will get started shortly. Thank you.
All right, hello everyone. Um, we're back and ready to start the webinar. Without any further ado, here is Martin Horsepool. Hello everybody, uh, good afternoon, good morning. Welcome to the webinar. I'll get started right away. Um, first of all, the agenda I have has several topics. Uh, just a very brief overview of the highlights of the FCC incentive auction that led to the repack. Uh, a little quick look at the timeline for the repack. And then, more importantly, um, for those of you that are transmitter engineers and people that take care of the transmission plant or station owners, what really is going to be affected at your RF plant? What components may require looking at, retuning, or replacement? And then the next really, really big question that many of you are asking us already is, can I retune my existing equipment, or do I need to replace it? And I'll answer that question, uh, at least for our products, and then um, you know we can see where it goes from there. Also, uh, I'll overview some of the latest trends in transmitter technology. So if you are purchasing new equipment, you'll benefit from these uh, technological advances. And then a quick overview of three different products that we have designed specifically for uh, USA repack purposes. First of all, the the spectrum repack really dates back to something called the National Broadband Plan, which was um, which was done back in 2010. Uh, this covered a lot of areas in which spectrum could be recovered for uh, increasing broadband usage across the United States, so people could have higher internet speeds and so forth. And part of that was quite a bit of wireless delivery of internet. So to do that, um, amongst other things, some of the UHF broadcast spectrum uh, was planned to be authorized or targeted to be switched over to um, broadband usage from broadcasting, over the air broadcasting. The original target was, <clears throat> excuse me, 120 megahertz of spectrum from the upper end of the UHF band. Um, as things progressed, you'll notice further down my slide that that actually got reduced to 84 megahertz. Uh, due to several rounds of um, stages of auction and trying to get the numbers to, to align properly, that the dollar numbers had to align properly, it ended up with 84 megahertz. Um, the actual auction started um, in 2016, and the final stage rule, which, which meant all the conditions were met, uh, was very recently, just January the 18th of this year. And it looks to us like about 1,200 to 1,290 stations would be in the um, would stations that need to be repacked out of the total. Uh, just a quick overview, any of any station that participated in the auction, basically there were four options. Number one was pretty simple, just relinquish your license and go off the air and get paid for that. Another one was to leave your current channel in order to share a channel with another broadcaster after the auction. This could be done. This, this would allow you to stay on the air, but by co uh, channel sharing. Another option was to relinquish a UHF channel, move either to high V or low V, and an option for a high V station was to move to a low V channel. So those were the four possibilities. Looking at the timeline going from 2012, when Congress actually authorized the auction plan, up to today, you'll see a few key milestone dates here, three of which uh, were gates there. We hosted three repack summits, uh, one per year from 2013 to 2015. And this was basically to bring in some broadcasting groups, but also the FCC and some of our equipment suppliers for antennas and RF systems and so forth, and get everybody together and discuss what could be done and what couldn't be done. Uh, then over the next few next year or so, um, there was a, a window for filing, um, filing for the auction, and then there was a filing close date followed by several stages of a forward and reverse auction. And I've only shown stage one where the bidding starts and stage four where the reverse auction was completed, which was this year. Um, and then that was about a month ago. And currently where we're at today is confidential letters have been sent out to television stations that are impacted and they have been given their channel assignments. So what are the next steps? Well, currently we're in a, what, what I would show here as a gray area. On that chart to the right, you'll see a little area um, that's between where the FCC sends out the confidential letters to stations and a beginning phase, which is shown as month zero on the bottom. That's actually the date when all the timing begins for the next steps. And the FCC is putting together a 10 phase transition plan. Um, and they're gonna issue 
issue a public notice uh, probably around March 30th, although I have heard of some different dates, but probably between March 30th and say about mid-April, you will see a uh, public notice which will um, provide everybody with the same information, what all the channel assignments are, those for the stations remaining on the air, what are their new channel assignments, or are they getting new channel assignments or not, plus a transition schedule. And the reason for having a 10-phase transition schedule or plan is because there are quite a few limitations on resources to do this type of work, particularly in the areas of uh, equipment manufacture, tower restructuring, uh, antenna manufacture and installation, and, and things like that, as well as services and consultants and, and the rest of the people that are involved. So the 10-phase transition plan is, is basically designed to reduce the load so it doesn't all happen at one instant in time. Um, so once the public notice has been released, which again should be around the end of this month, sorry, the end of March, um, there will be a filing and approval for construction permits, which is 90 days. And then the final date at the end of all of this, when construction, installation, and testing has been completed, targeted for 39 months. And there are a couple of scenarios that have been recently published in an FCC public notice, which I've printed here on the right, so you can see one of them. This is scenario A. So going forward from today, uh, once the FCC has released these uh, channel assignments and given some particulars about the 10-phase um, plan to, to, to put everybody onto the new channels, uh, then you have, basically, you have 90 days to file construction permits and get everything in place. And beyond that, really, you're into the construction phase, the testing phase, and so forth. And you can see that these phases are spread out over time, over quite a long period of time, to really give everybody the transition to the new channel. And then if everything falls into place per the FCC plan, it'll all be done before the 39-month deadline, which is the completion deadline. Um, the problem with this is it does require everything to go pretty much perfectly. And any delay in any one of these phases could very easily or will, in fact, cause a delay to the following phase. So it's a bit of a domino effect, I think. So many industry experts have challenged those dates, and many people think that it's probably going to take a bit longer. In fact, we believe the likely time needed for completion realistically may be more along the lines of 72 months. So that could take it way out into 2023 if that happens. But somewhere in between those two dates is, is quite likely. The impact on, on which stations or how many stations will have to rebuild their transmission infrastructure does vary depending on certain um, parameters that are taken into consideration. We will know soon enough what the actual number is, but we estimate currently that between 1,000 and 1,150 stations will actually need to rebuild their transmission infrastructure as part of the repack process. So the next big question, and one which I will attempt to answer is, what is going to be affected in your RF plant should you be given a new television channel? So some of you that have attended our repack summits over the last three years have already seen this diagram. Others may not have seen it. This is basically a very simplified diagram of your RF plant. This is what's at the transmitter building. Um, there are some other components beyond this which you should look at. Um, but the main RF components are shown here. The transmitter, internally there would be an exciter, some amplifier stages, power supplies, control, and cooling. Externally to the transmitter, but within the building, typically you have items like low-pass filters, mass filters, mining, if you're combining two transmitters or an, another station's transmitter into one, transmission or feed line, uh, patch panel switches, dummy loads, and then Externally from the building, we'll have a long run or short run of transmission line or waveguide up a tower to the antenna at the far end where the signal is obviously broadcast. Um, beyond what's shown on this diagram, there are some other things that need to be looked at. Uh, I could think of things like step-down transformers, voltage regulators, surge suppressors, uh, electrical components such as those. Um, so th there are many things to consider, and probably a, a site survey by 
uh, by yourself or a consultant or, or one of your transmitter suppliers such as us, uh, we could come and do that for you. So here are the things that I think will be affected. Primarily the items that are now colored in red. Um, not always affected, but the power amplifier may be banded, may be narrow band, may require retuning, needs to be looked at. Uh, the exciter I put in yellow because possibly affected depends on the age of the exciter. If it's a new exciter, it's probably fine. If it's an old one, it definitely should be replaced. Uh, outside of the transmitter, but within the building, virtually every RF component needs to be looked at to see if it can be used on the new channel. Uh, we can't say definitively if these items here would actually work on a new channel. It would depend on many factors. But you could certainly consult the equipment supplier, um, either your transmitter supplier or your RF system vendor for further information. This goes all the way to the antenna. So many, many items to be looked at here. I'm going to study just the transmitter part for the rest of this uh, webinar because we just don't have enough time to cover every item here. So moving on to the question about whether or not I can change the channel of my existing transmitter, yes or no. It's a good question. We get asked it many times. Uh, the slide that should be in front of you now shows four of our products. Uh, I will have to add that none of these products are currently in production. So it's a very good question. Can I retune that? Will you help me? You know, is there somebody that can do this for me? And can I just press a button like on a remote control to do it? Actually, no. It would require some engineering. If any of these can be channel changed, it's not going to be quite that simple. So some of the questions you might ask yourself or do some investigation about, first of all, depending on what you have, and it may be a, a transmitter that's no longer manufactured, perhaps the manufacturer of that transmitter is not even in business. So there's, there's a question to ask right now, because if the manufacturer is not in business, probably you will have to replace your transmitter. There aren't going to be too, too many people available that are knowledgeable or knowledgeable enough to work on it, to change frequencies um, and do retuning and calibration. Plus, you know, are the parts available? I mean, it's quite likely that they, there are a few parts here and there, but are there enough to change many, many of these transmitters? Probably not. The other question you ask yourself is what would it actually cost to change the channel? It's going to be incredibly expensive. You might really consider um, looking at a new transmitter anyway. The other good question is, will I break it or changing channels? That's You probably don't think you would, but many things can happen. Equipment that's been sitting there running for many, many years reliably. Once you start turning knobs or moving things around, it's quite possible something abnormal could happen that would be very hard to repair. And then you've got the question, can anybody fix it? The other good question is, can I stay on the air while changing channels? Will I need a backup transmitter and so forth? And some of those questions will actually be answered in tomorrow's webinar, which will be presented uh, you know, tomorrow at some point, uh, 11 a.m.? 2 o'clock, sorry. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the other thing is, of course, obsolescence and part support. So there's many questions to ask about channel changing. But let's look at some of the products that Gates Air has manufactured over the past years. The one up on the uh, slide deck right now, Sigma or Sigma CD. This is based on standard IOTs, not the high efficiency types. There were many versions of this transmitter. Uh, earliest versions are very, very obsolete. Later versions um, are still supportable. However, none of these are in production today. So this does limit the amount of service, spare parts, uh, and so forth available to channel change these. And you may have various combinations of components in there that either are obsolete or about to become obsolete. So there are, there are many questions to ask. And there are always some frequency or banded, frequency banded components within these. If you look at the fact that the transmitter hasn't been available for quite a long time, we're only limited in spare parts, probably enough to support and service currently the units that are in service today. Uh, we really don't feel that it's applicable to do frequency changing, channel changing, power upgrades, or anything else to this product. So the verdict is replace. Next product I'm going to look at is a, a newer version of an, MS, of an IoT transmitter, the Power CD, which uses the high efficiency energy saving collector technology, uh, which uses multiple stage depressed collectors. Uh, this product is a lot newer. Certainly, it's quite supportable. Uh, in general, most of the components within that transmitter um, 
are wideband, broadband. The tube itself can be retuned uh, with some caveats there because there may be some specific cavity parts on a few channels, possibly. The tube supplier can help to answer questions there. There were three circulators used across the channels that you could be using today between 14 and 51. So it's possible that circulators have to be changed. And the same goes with low-pass filters. But we believe that this product is retunable with some caveats. Um, if the transmitter is in good condition today, uh, it's running fine, doesn't need massive repair. We believe that these are retunable. However, because it is very, very risky to touch IOTs that have been serviced for several years, there's a chance something will get broken. So I would highly recommend planning on new tubes, new tubes for each socket and other parts as needed. Um, please consult us or your transmitter um, repair person to provide further details. Another product is a solid state transmitter, which was designed in the early days of ATSC uh, for the US market specifically and uh, Mexico and Canada. Diamond. Diamond is also a, a, a very good transmitter. It's, it's reliable. Uh, it is, however, a banded product. There are three bands covering channels 14 to 51. Another um, item to mention here is, of course, it's another transmitter that's for quite a long time now not been in production. This does mean that although we have parts needed to support our existing customer base of transmitters, we certainly don't have enough parts to rebuild or build brand new power amplifier modules on a different channel band. So that's the biggie with this one. Plus there are a few other frequency um, sensitive or frequency um, narrow band components. So uh, in general, this is a replace product in general. Next product, Platinum CD. This is a VHF transmitter. It's actually been a workhorse for VHF for many, many years. I look back to find when we had introduced the first analog version of this product. It was 31 years ago. It's been discontinued for quite a long time now. Uh, I realize that many of the analog transmitters, the old Platinum analogs, were in fact converted for ATSC operation. Plus, we designed a version of this which was called Platinum ATSC. Uh, Platinum CD, which, which became our VHF um, HSC transmitter. Again, we only have enough parts to support products that may be in warranty or post-warranty repair, but we certainly don't have enough parts to build brand new amplifier modules. And these were actually designed to be specifically on one channel. So in all cases, we are suggesting replacement of this product. What about other brand transmitters? Uh, there's quite a few out there from various manufacturers. Um, two of the three I've shown here are actually manufacturers that no longer manufacture transmitters. Um, so those, I think, are pretty obvious um, replace. Uh, you'll find that support may exist for some of these products, but it is very limited. There are very few people capable of replacement of parts, retuning, or repair of these products. So I would, in general, say that the rule of thumb here is also replace these transmitters. Which brings me nicely to the next topic, which is what about new transmitters designed for repack? And I stay to hear repack and beyond because you don't want a transmitter that's good just for a few years. Most transmitters last for 10 years, 15 years, or even 20 years. The slide up now shows our Gates Air Maxiva product family which ranges from very, very low power, just a few watts, up to well over 100 kilowatts in UHF, and up to around 25 kilowatts or so for VHF. These are all solid state transmitters. You will find there are no current um, IoT transmitters left in our product portfolio. The ones that I'm going to specifically focus on for the next few minutes are the Maxiva UAXTE, which is an air-cooled UHF high efficiency transmitter. The Maxiva ULXTE, which is a liquid cooled high efficiency solid state transmitter. And then on the VHF side, I'm going to discuss very, very briefly our VHF product, the VAXTE. But before I do that, I just want to introduce one recent advance in UHF RF device or transistor technology, and that's 
the asymmetrical Doherty device, which is on the right-hand side of this slide. So we are currently uh, adopting the Amplion 888E, which is an asymmetrical device designed specifically for high efficiency um, OFDM television modulation amplification. The device previous to that, which is the 888D, is actually a very similar device, but it's a symmetrical Doherty device. And you'll notice if you look at the data here, I won't read off every item, but they're very, very similar in terms of gain, um, efficiency, although the efficiency is slightly better on the uh, asymmetrical Doherty. Other factors there are very, very similar. And probably the only really technical slide in my presentation is this one. Um, what's the difference between asymmetrical and symmetrical two-stage Doherty? It's shown here. A symmetrical Doherty has device has two parts in one package or two transistors in one package of equal power level. One is operated um, as a peaking amplifier. The other is operated as a carrier amplifier. In a traditional two-stage Doherty circuit, the power levels where each device can operate up to is exactly six dBs different. So the peak to average, or the average to peak power of these two devices is 6 dB is different. That fit in, that did fit in very well with ATSC-1 modulation, which has around a 6 dB peak to average ratio. So you'd have pretty good efficiency on ATSC-1, not quite as good on OFDM, although it worked reasonably well. The newer device, being asymmetrical, actually has one device that's bigger than the other inside the package. It actually handles more power. And the way the circuit now works, and the math is shown on the right, um, it ends up being that the difference in power between the average or carrier amplifier and the peaking amplifier is almost 8 dBs, which happens to be about the same peak to average ratio as an OFDM television signal. So this becomes a more ideal device for an OFDM amplifier, which looking forward to HSC 3.0 fits the bill perfectly. So, the two UHF transmitters shown in this slide actually use that device, just so you know. The VHF one is still, the VHS one is using a um, symmetrical Doherty device. So, the three products I'm going to talk about briefly are the UHF high power. Some of our criteria were how can we replace IoTs cost effectively? How can we reduce the footprint from an IoT transmitter? Solid state has become more power dense, so this became easier and easier as we found higher and higher power level devices. We also would like it to be more reliable than an IoT. Uh, because it uses no high voltage, that became fairly easy to achieve. And also, if possible, more efficient than an IoT. Uh, here we found that we now have products that are more efficient than traditional IoTs, and at least as efficient as MSDC or ESC type IoTs. And in fact, in some cases, slightly more, more efficient. We also wanted to design in a simple upgrade path to HSC 3.0. And our solution for UHF high power is a liquid cooled transmitter called a ULXTE. Similarly, we had the same criteria for UHF medium power for stations not requiring quite as high a power level. Um, same criteria, same upgrade path, and so forth. So um, that's the UAXTE series, which I will also describe briefly. And then for VHF customers, or stations moving from U to V, we needed to find a cost-effective platinum replacement. Again, smaller footprint than the old transmitter because space at the transmitter site may be limited. Uh, also more efficient than the old transmitter. Again, the same upgrade path to HSC3. So moving first, looking at the UHF high power product, um, we built in a new, some features that were important to customers primarily, hot swappable front load components, such as power amplifiers and power supplies. We've also integrated a new exciter called the XTE. And the XTE differs from the M2X that a lot of customers of ours are familiar with. The main difference is this exciter has a simple software only upgrade path to HSC 3.0 for future 3.0 operation. It also has the advantage you can store two modulations at once and just easily switch between the two. So it could be an early revision of a, of a certain modulation and a newer revision, or it could be two different modulation codes, for example, HSC1 and HSC3. We've also done some improvements due to basically better performing components within the exciter. Uh, we've done some improvements to the linear, nonlinear pre-correction, the real-time adaptive correction. So now it works faster, but it also has the ability to correct more accurately 
the distortions of a Doherty amplifier, which are harder to correct for than, than linear class AB uh, designs. The other important feature is because we're, we've gone to the new, new types of devices, we now have parity in power between ATSC 8 VSB or ATSC 1 and ATSC 3.0. So a future upgrade down the road, uh, a modulation change to 3.0, the average power level stays exactly the same as it does today. And of course, some customers would like the ability to add power later. Perhaps for HSC 3, they decided that they need, or they made a decision that they will need more power. Uh, perhaps they're adding elliptical polarization or vertical polarization. You will need more power to do that. So those are the key, key features. Um, we do have a couple of choices on the amplifiers. We have what we call ultra wideband, which covers all of the channels that you currently have today from 14 to beyond channel 51 with no retuning, no adjustments whatsoever. We also have, using the newer um, devices available today, the 888E type device, we have some higher efficiency solutions that are in three different categories or three different bands shown here. Uh, very quick overview of the XTE exciter is shown on the next slide. Uh, this, of course, was designed by us, built by us, manufactured by Gates Air. It's a 1RU box, uh, so it's half the size of its predecessor. Has a lot more flexibility in, in terms of its ability to store two modulations and has quite a bit of improved signal processing power, which enables us to make better performance, push the amplifiers to their highest power levels, and of course, improve the efficiency at the same time. Two key benefits shown here, I won't have time to go through all of them, is the lightweight modules make it very easy for one customer, or one person, one transmitter engineer to go to the site, pull one out that needs servicing, and just plug another one in its place. Very quick, easy to do. It's small. It's very lightweight uh, and simple. Same with the power supplies. We've elected to have separate power supplies not built into the power amplifiers. This enables just the power supply to be replaced should it fail or have a problem or need to be cleaned, whatever, versus replacing the whole amplifier drawer. And of course, being a separate power supply, it's much, much lighter and can be replaced in just a few seconds. Um, the next slide shows a very simplified RF block diagram of a two power block um, ULXTE transmitter with two exciters in a dual drive configuration. Uh, the RF path from the two exciters, one is selected or the other, depending on which one's active. It will do auto switch over um, if needed. If, if you disconnect an exciter for servicing or, or, or there's a problem, it will switch automatically to the other one. Then the signal is split into two paths where each power block can almost be looked at as a, as a separate transmitter of its own. It has its own control built in, its own an outlet, its own RF path, power, power dividers and combiners and, and so forth, as well as its own little you know, control circuitry. Two phase and gain modules for redundancy with a switch, and then power amplifiers that are in parallel. Each of those has its own power supply. And every time you add a power block, you just keep adding these same components over and over again. So for a very large transmitter that, say, has nine power blocks, there'll be nine of what's shown in power block one in this diagram. And finally, at the output of each rack, we would have an external combining network of hybrids, reject loads, and a mask filter. And the next diagram that's coming up <clears throat> shows the control system block diagram. And the reason I'm showing that is there is quite a high level of redundancy here. We have an overall transmitter supervisor, which is located in the first rack near the top. This is taking care of the external web interface, customer remote, parallel GPIO connections, front panel on off buttons and so forth. But each power block does have its own power block controller. And these are capable of operating that power block, even if it's disconnected from the main transmitter supervisor. This enables you to stay operational at full power um, should that transmitter supervisor ever need to be serviced, disconnected or replaced. Um, likewise, since each power block has its own power block controller, you can simply unplug one of these and the other power blocks in a multi-power block system will continue to operate with one power block down. Cooling system. Uh, all of our high power transmitters use external pumps and heat exchangers. A picture, pictures of these are shown on the right. Again, we manufacture our own components here. They're not purchased parts. Um, we've been optimizing the performance of these components over the years. 
uh, we're now in our third generation, you will find that the pumps are extremely quiet. That's an indoor pump module, which makes it nice and easy to service, uh, but they're very, very quiet. Um, the pump module itself is designed such as you can easily access one pump or the other while you're on the air, disconnect it and isolate it and replace it should that pump need to be refurbished. Same goes for the cooling fans. They each have their own electrical circuit, their own electrical disconnect, and they can be isolated individually for repair and replacement. And those fans are, are also extremely quiet, and they're, they're speed optimized or speed controlled depending on the ambient temperatures and the coolant temperature. So on a cool day, the fans run slower. You do save energy. Here, here are a few of the models. Um, Starting with a ULX to E20, we do make smaller models than this. We also make larger ones, but these are just a few of them. And the one on the right is a 38 kilowatt transmitter using two full racks of power blocks, six power blocks. Um, if you wanted to power increase that by 50%, add a third rack to the right or to the left, wherever you want to place it, add the RF combining components, a few control cables and some RF distribution at low level you would have a larger transmitter. This one would be a 56 kilowatt transmitter. Not very big. This is already much smaller than the IoT transmitter that it's going to replace. Plus, don't forget, no high voltage, no beam supplies, and so forth. This is a bit of an eye chart, but we've decided to introduce many, many different power levels of transmitters because um, the closer you can size your solid state transmitter to the actual power level you need, the more efficient it will be, the less space it may take up, and, and the overall total cost of ownership, including the purchase price, will be, will be better. So we have a lot of power levels to uh, match as closely as possible to the existing transmitter that might be being replaced. And the ones shown on this page are actually our, uh, what I call single-ended models. These are not dual transmitters. These go all the way up to 150 PA transmitters spread out across five 19-inch racks and can produce about almost 93 kilowatts of ATSC 1 or 3 uh, power, average power. And this is pre-filter power level. Then we also have dual transmitters, which are really two completely separate transmitters plus a control rack. Some customers still prefer this type of configuration, so we have them available, primarily designed for higher power customers anyway, but they do go down to relatively low power levels also. Um, so these power levels can be configured for very large, very high power levels up to a maximum of 150 kilowatts free filter. That sort of sums up very briefly our UHF high power offering. For UHF medium power, we have the equivalent as an air-cooled product. This is called UAXTE. And UAXTE is again the same broadband high efficiency design. It actually uses the same power amplifier module as the liquid cooled, except it is mounted on a heat sink rather than a liquid cooling plate. That's physically the main difference. Plus, it makes it about three times as big because of the heat sink area that, and volume and size that it needs to uh, take up to be cooled adequately. Um, but it is a very modular design. We can put up to eight of these power amplifier modules in one rack um, and be configured from two to eight, depending on the power level needed. And then beyond that, we can add more racks up to a total of four. The folder in the middle actually shows two racks at 9.6 kilowatts. At the right, you'll see a couple of the components that go within that. Um, a power amplifier, once you remove the cover, you'll see the front. There's, there's the heat sink where the air is drawn through from the front. The fans are in the rear. And one or two power supplies can be installed in that. It will actually run on one. The second one is a redundancy option. Uh, we also developed a, a different exciter driver or low power unit used to drive these air-cooled amplifiers. It's basically an XTE exciter, but with an added controller, some front panel push buttons, and a lower power or about 100 watts uh, RF amplifier built into the chassis. Again, designed and built by us, 2RU chassis, um, all the same software-defined modulations are available, the same as uh, the XTE exciter. So it has the same features and the same real-time adaptive correction as the basic XTE. The product family looks a bit like this. I've shown the extremes here from the very low end. We can scale the UAXTE down to 10 watts, up to 100 watts in a 2RU chassis. And we have a, a slightly bigger block. There's four rack units in height that uh, goes up to around five, five or 600 watts. And beyond that, we have power levels 
uh, up to 19.2, almost 20 kilowatts in 4x. So the uh, model number and power level chart looks looks like this. The slide this up currently, showing the physical sizes, RF connectors at the output, numbers of racks or number of rack units, and so forth. So that leaves one transmitter family left to discuss, the VHF product line. I only have one slide on this one because I knew we would be a little bit limited in time. But the architecture of this transmitter is almost identical to the UAXTE. It's the same look and feel from the front, same physical size RF amplifier blocks, same air cooled concept, same 2RU um, version of the XTE, the, the UAXTE LPU to drive it. The only difference, of course, is the amplifier is different. You use a different RF device. It's a, it's a symmetrical Doherty VHF 50-volt um, LDMOS device. It's capable of a little bit more power, has a slightly higher power density per device. So in one rack, we can get up to um, 6.4 kilowatts, and in four racks, up to just over 25 kilowatts. Again, these are pre-mask filter power levels. And like I said, most of the features of this are identical to the UHF version. The differences are in the amplifiers and, of course, the RF combining that's in the rear of this rack. So that brings me to conclusion of my uh, today's webinar. And I hope everybody um, got something out of it. And it's been a pleasure talking to you today. Uh, Keith, do we have any questions? So thanks a lot, Martin. We we uh, definitely appreciate appreciate you participating and giving us a little bit of info, if not a lot of bit of info. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of housekeeping here before we get questions going. Um, but for those who aren't aware, there's a live chat area below the video of this webinar um, where any questions you might have, feel free to enter them in and um, we'll read them and answer them. And um, certainly, uh, you know, what, what Martin can answer, he will do so. That said, we do have two webinars that are coming up tomorrow and Thursday. Uh, tomorrow is Navigating the Transition. Both of these webinars are going to be at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard, um, which I believe is 11 Pacific. But uh, tomorrow's focus is a little bit on service and installation and um, some of the things that we can do to help out, particularly with um, preparation for post-auction logistics, uh, dealing with channel assignment, site survey, and uh, some reimbursement questions, uh, which I believe will be fairly uh, hot topics for people. So definitely tune in tomorrow, where Steve Rossiter, our TV systems applications engineer, and Nathan Smith, who is our program management and training um, di uh, director, manager, uh, I get everyone's titles wrong, but I just know he's very cool and knowledgeable. Uh, I believe David Motley as well, the uh, TV service support supervisor will be there as well. So we're going to get some great um, input from people on uh, the transition. <clears throat> and on Thursday, we have a big event, the Repack Roundtable, also Eastern Standard. Uh, experts here and abroad uh, will be participating, uh, discussing things like um, the small market station preparation, more reimbursement scenarios, ATSC 3.0 uh, deployment, um, effects on FM stations, um, and a lot more. It's going to going to be really nice because Rich Redman, our chief product officer, Martin will also be there as well for Thursday. And uh, Joe Cecilia, who is our market and product development strategy guy, is very, very involved in ATSC 3.0 deployment. He'll be part of the forum, as well as Mark Voorhees, who is our director of sales for the Americas um, for key accounts. And we have a special guest, Pamela Gallant, from the FCC, the Associate Division Chief of Video. She'll be there as well. So it, it is definitely in your best interest to be at both of these webinars tomorrow. Um, but in the real world that we live in, um, you know, you may not be able to attend uh, all of this goodness. Your schedules are probably busy because you work in broadcasting. You listen to this. Um, just so you know, we are definitely putting these on our YouTube channel. In fact, this very webinar should be on our YouTube channel, uh, youtube.com slash user slash Gatesair, shortly after the presentation today, after the Q&A session. So um, without further ado, we do have uh, one question from Spencer the Boss. 
And his question was whether it's going to be today or tomorrow or, or one or the other. He was curious what uh, you might be able to talk about with the flex use in exchange for relocation um, approach to what the FCC is um, trying to offer people with the repack. I don't know if, if you can speak to that. I, I actually don't have the answer aligned for that. Let's leave that one, to, keep a note of that one. Let's, let's keep that one for Thursday's roundtable. I think it'll be, we'll have the perfect group of experts together and we can answer that better than I can to be honest. Okay. Awesome. Um, and of course, um, I believe I, uh, yeah, I just answered this one earlier. Uh, Frederick asks, will this, will this presentation be available for download yes. on the site later? Yes. <coughs> yep. Um, and yeah, we, we actually hope that uh, we can get some good feedback from people, uh, not just for repack, but, but other topics that they'd be interested in having us attack via webinars or a podcast that we're planning for later in 2017. What would you say is probably one of the audio on YouTube? Audio on, audio on YouTube. Oh yeah. yeah, there you go. Um, what's the um, maybe a top question that you've heard from people? that have asked in terms of um, the upcoming technologies that we plan on showing at NAB, for example, ULXTE, what's one of the biggest things you want to let people know that'll kind of blow them away as far as repack and beyond? Well, I, I think there's, there's many, many things that could be very important depending on the customer. So, you know, the, one, the ones I've highlighted are probably the most important, they're very high efficiency. Um, in some cases, the efficiency is so much higher than the existing product, you will halve the power consumption of the existing transmitter. I can guarantee that will be the case against the diamond or platinum transmitter. We will halve the power consumption or better. Just by this, you'll, you'll immediately see a benefit in power savings and, and basically your, your monthly electrical bill will go down. So there's one benefit <laughs> there. Um, that's the biggest one. Uh, the others are, this is a very flexible product. And looking ahead, and I mentioned this several times, when HSC 3.0 does come, this transmitter is already ready for that modulation. And it's basically a software key. It's not free, but it's also not very expensive. Talk to a salesperson about that, but hardware is ready to go. And this will be available to, for people to view at, at the show? Yes, yes, okay. yes. We'll be able to, to demonstrate and show them the product at the show. So we'll have, we'll have all of the products that we've shown in this uh, webinar at the NAB show to look at. Okay. And for those unaware, um, please visit us at booth, um, I believe it's N2613. Um, and if for some odd reason I'm wrong, uh, <laughs> which actually there's, I'm not perfect, I'm wrong sometimes, but definitely visit gatesair.com slash media center, media dash center slash events. Um, I think it may even be on the homepage, <laughs> just a quick link to get to our events. Um, so yeah, um, I, we will wait a little bit for other questions. Um, oh, you're welcome, Spencer. Uh, he, he, he mentioned um, particularly where the flex use information can be found oh, and great, what it is. And, um, it's a thanks for trying. But I think for sure, as far as um, asking on Thursday, for sure, that's probably where you want to go. I think Steve Rossiter tomorrow might even have some input. Um, he's actually pretty, yeah, pretty pretty yeah, knowledgeable. Yeah. We can we can ask him ahead of time if so he has the answer anyway. So. Yeah, definitely <laughs> because because tomorrow's for sure will, um, you know, part of that transition approach is, you know, knowing that there's a lot of time that it's going to take to get things to the final point of your of your you know broadcast chain. Um, a lot of people need temporary solutions and they're using transmitters for multiple reasons. Um, they don't necessarily want to, as soon as possible, throw a baby out with bathwater. So um, Steve is pretty familiar with a lot of different approaches and um, as are a lot of our guys in, right. in the field. So, I think your information was so precise and wonderful that no questions, questions. <laughs> see, well, right when i said that there is the jinx um scott, scott kessler asks um is the current uax 2000 retunable 
Yes. So the UAX and ULX, which is the UAX is the air-cooled current series that we sold. Actually, we pretty much stopped building those now, but up until very recently, that was that was a current product. That's that is broadband. It's class A B amplification. It's not as efficient as the new products, but it is fully retunable across the band. Excellent. Of course, he will need a new RF system probably or retunable. If he's got a retunable filter, that will have to be retuned naturally to the new channel. So it is um, right now 2.52 p.m. as we record this uh, Eastern Standard Time. Uh, we definitely have up until 3 o'clock allotted um, but for sure, um, if you have any extra questions, please feel free. We may end a little bit early. But um, if you are interested in asking Martin any more questions, where can you be reached, Martin? You can reach me at uh, the easiest way is to send me an email because I'm going to be traveling in, a, in an hour or so. <laughs> uh, it's martin, M-A-R-T-Y-N dot horsepool, H-O-R-S-P-O-O-L, like you see it spelt on this slide, at gatesair.com. And please send me any questions questions that you have if i don't have the answers i know who to go to to get them there you go and of course he will be returning for thursday's webinar um, again as a recap for the rest of the series tomorrow navigating the transition is at 2 p.m eastern standard time and uh repack roundtable is thursday march 2nd at 2 p.m eastern standard time if you need links to those specific webinars feel free to contact me um, my name is Keith Adams, and that would be K-E-I-T-H dot A-D-A-M-S at GatesAir.com is the email. Or you can send to marketing at GatesAir.com. That's a fast one, too, and more people have access and can answer your questions as well. So, again, thanks very much for taking your time out and listening. Um, we look forward to seeing you tomorrow, and uh, thanks very much for being part of the Mission Possible Spectrum Repack webinar series. Have a great day.